Hi, welcome to the Poultry Keepers Podcast. I'm Rip Stalvey, and together with Mandolin Royal and John Gunnerman, we're your co-hosts for this show, and it's our mission to help you have a happy, healthy, and productive flock. In the breeding pen, I like to use birds that have a problem and mate them to birds who meet the standard in that particular area. Not exceed the standard or not less than the standard, but meet the standard. And then you go through those offspring and you look for the percentage that picked up that one parent that had it pretty close Yeah. versus taking extremes. You'll be lucky to find one that picked up something normal versus the rest of them having one extreme or the other. If one parent is doing something correctly, that's the sort of pairing you want to do to kind of compensate for any flaws the other part of that breeding equation has. I think one thing that this brings to the top of my mind as we're talking about this is that the important thing is to keep good records followed very closely by established, well, I'm, going to get ahead of myself and I don't want to do that, but just keeping good records and going to serve you so very well. And, and Mandy was talking about taking lots of pictures. I don't know how we survived breeding birds before the age of uh, digital cameras and cell phones. Everybody had the notebook in their back pocket. (laughs) Blue ribbons on the wall or the lack of them. (laughs) No, the notebook in the back pocket. Famous last words is I don't need to remember that. I don't, or yeah, uh, yeah. I don't yeah, need yeah, to write that down. I'll remember it, uh, especially at my age and picking up a few knocks in the head over my lifetime. Uh, write it down. Have, have your bird in your back pocket all the time. Well, and there's been a couple of times now to where I'll pick a bird up and I'll check over all the details. I monitored the growth and this bird just was checking off box after box after box. And I'm like, wow, this is probably the best bird I've bred all season. I really wish I knew who the parents were. Yep. Because then that almost says I don't need to hatch from anybody else other than those two parents. Well, it should be as easy as looking at the wing band number or the leg band number and pulling out that notebook I was talking about and going, who are you? Who is your sire and dam? Okay, there you go. I'm definitely going to start doing that because I have questions that I can't answer. (laughs) I tried doing it on the computer and I get lost in my own spreadsheets. Uh, it gets frustrating now. I lose you my know. notebooks or they get rained on or something goofy. So I have to right take my rain notebook product. and then run them inside and add them to the spreadsheet. So I found out in the military, right in the rain makes a pen and a notebook. They were designed for the space shuttle. but And I tested it. They will write upside down underwater in scuba gear. Costs a little bit more going in, but they never get destroyed. Even a puppy chewing on it will not hurt it badly. Hmm. What about? The need to establish a good, sound, strong breeder selection program and a management program. What's your thoughts on that, John? Well, I I do that every fall, and that's when I start getting panicky. Is when I'm choosing which two or three roosters and which, you know, I, I want to carry over ideally sixteen birds going into the winter because we do have a. And it's somewhat expected loss every year. I get attacked by ermine when it gets warm and rainy in the spring. Uh, and then that, that always sets a panic. But I do keep two weeks worth of eggs in reserve. So if I, do lose, if I do lose a rooster, I, at least I know I've got his genetics as backup somewhere in there. But yeah, the king, the heir, the spare. I, I'm going for the three clan spiral rotation. So I've got, and that's what I do. But if I find somebody where I, I really want this hen and this rooster, I mean, they're just the best ever. If they're in different clans, so be it. I just made a fourth clan if that's what we did and just increase my record keeping a little bit and drop another clan off if it turns out successful. Yeah, I'm constantly filtering the birds. And I don't think there's any such thing as too late to call. Sometimes I'm getting birds that are a year, year and a half, two, three, four, five years old that, I mean, the cook method changes for sure with the age. Handling the bird and then I put him in the cone and I was like, wow, I won't go down because he's just so wide in the shoulders. Then I saw the spread in the, the back and I'm going, and I went, nope, you live. I mean, the structure that was hiding, it was supposed to be a meat bird. 
somehow it was just hiding and it was there and I was able to save him at the last minute. I think Mandy just shared a quote with folks and I want to reiterate what she said because it's that important. Your hands will tell you a lot about your business. Once you know what you're feeling for and you feel it on a bird that you hadn't really looked too much at as far as like when you're reviewing pens, you can find one, two, three favorites by comparing the visuals to each other. But when you get your hands on them, so I've had birds surprise me before. And like there was a male I left him in rooster coop. And that's where I'll grow out like 25 boys at a time. And something had spooked them. And I was finding birds in places they shouldn't have been. And I saw this one male. He was the leader of the group. And he had been reprieved the time before because I couldn't catch him. <laughs> and then I put the next batch of boys in and he decided he was going to take care of them and be the leader. So I found him over in a pig pen next door and I cornered him and I was able to catch him that time. And when I put my hands on him and picked him up, he was so fleshy and meaty and well-rounded in the carcass. Like he felt incredible. So instead of putting him back in the rooster coop, I took him up to the barn and put him in his own pen to save for later. <laughs> and we're always on the lookout for that one in a hundred bird. Uh, you you touched on something and it just brought me back to boot camp in the Navy with my chief saying, I'm a filter, not a pump. But that that mindset and that adage is so spot on, I think. That that's what we're we're constantly doing. We yeah, we're setting a lot of eggs, but our whole goal is to filter down and just find the best ones to carry the best genetics forward. Yeah, because one of the worst things you can do is try to push for quantity, but they run out of space and overcrowd them because that's going to limit their growth. It's going to yeah. potentially give you some health issues, especially if the ammonia load gets too heavy. That'll affect it. It was Jeff's book that said, if you can smell the ammonia, it's already 10 times too, too high for the birds themselves. Keep Make it sure you've got grow out space and a plan for every egg that you set yeah if you can't get really rid of it what are you going to do with it because you know, i think you're responsible for the life that you bring in even though it is you know just a bird it's you have a level of responsibility to treat it ethically and humanely well and to give them the chance to reach their potential too so stick to your goals you know the important thing is and this is kind of how i found you initially mandy was your picking up and reviewing your birds the videos that you put online of evaluating your birds you know how you recommend people use your hand as the measuring gauge it doesn't matter what size your hand is because you're measuring the birds in your flock and selecting from within the ones that meet your goals yeah it's definitely peer against peer within your own flock you're not comparing to anybody else's so use your own hands on your own birds and figure out what you're feeling after processing is a good time to handle them some more too to get familiar with what they feel like so you can kind of transfer that knowledge to what it feels like when they still have their feathers on so that then you can recognize those birds before it's too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's been a couple of times where we would get in the groove of processing. My husband would snatch them and go ahead and do the deed. And then I ended up with the carcass and I'm like, whoa, 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 this one's really nice. Actually, <laughs> I've, I've had birds come out of the oven room like, damn, how'd you get in there? And then I remind myself it probably had funky wings or a goofy tail set or there was something visual that I didn't care for. Oh, so I, I found have... broken legs that have healed in my chicken casserole. When you get down to the drumstick and you're like, oh, I remember this bird. Yeah, it broke its leg doing this when it was a chick. Yeah, rough handling sometimes. Birds get broken, but I still have this compulsion if it's not a genetic defect and it's not going to make them suffer the rest of their life, I'll carry them through. They still get the best life I can give them. I'm a softie like that. Do you feel like it's important to be consistent from year to year to year in how we do our selection of birds? I mean, should we use the same methods? Should we vary them? Depends. The flock goals will help you figure out what methods you need to be using. Like for me personally, I have a top five trait that needs to be there in any bird that I carry forward. So that's their fleshing, their bone spacing and structure, the health and vigor, you know, some things that are just like a 
non-negotiable list. And after that, what I'm looking for changes based on what I'm seeing I need to improve. So I'm not really looking at tail angles on every single bird because I have a pen for that, for that tree. And because I have the luxury of pen space and I can organize them, I can pick off five or six traits I want to work on and do that within certain pens. And I have a lot of flexibility there from one season to the next. I just don't step away from my top five needed traits. Those core things have to be there and everything else is bonus and subjective and varies season to season. The baseline I consider good enough to move forward and then incremental improvements. Yeah, and then use the compensation mating and finding out who they throw the best results with and figuring out what pen they really belong in by the time they're two. And if they're still here when they're two, then I'm going to hatch everything that bird lays because those are the best of the best of the best. (laughs) One thing that I found worked really well for me is that when I evaluate a bird using my hands, I typically follow the same procedure from one bird to the next. I'll pick up a bird, and when I'm picking up that bird, I'm already measuring the length of the keel using the palm of my hand and my middle finger. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I can also evaluate the um, basic fleshing qualities of that bird by just applying a little pressure from the side. Uh, I'll fold out the same wings. Invariably, I fold out the bird's left wing first and then go over and look at the right wing. Um, and then I move on to back with. Well, you and have move- that show judge experience, too. But I was doing that way before I started judging. So you found your groove before that on what you were looking for and you had a systematic approach to how you handled them. I guess that would help the birds come up with expectations of when they get caught. (laughs) Well, (laughs) one thing that I found it did for me was I was able to more consistently evaluate birds. It was easier for me to say, is bird A better than bird B, or is it bird B rather than, better than bird C? Just It was a familiar process that I found myself getting into that, that served me well over the years. Still does. One thing I added a couple of years ago that has been absolutely invaluable was a viewing area. And I'm going to expand it because right now I can look at three birds next to each other at a time. They're on a table, front and center right in front of me so I can see them in that visual side by side but they're also already caught in a cage so I can handle this one and then that one and then go back to the other one and then check the other guy put them all back step back stare at them for a couple minutes and I can because I still have some clutter in my brain on what exactly I'm looking for on any given season (laughs) and finding who the best is out of a group is tricky and subjective because like if you put 10 breeders in a room with 20 birds and you told each of those breeders pick the best three out of these birds you might get totally different they're all going to have their own things that they're looking for and having the same breeder pick the same three birds as the next breeder i mean that's almost impossible i think it's almost impossible with judges Yeah, I can only imagine how cutthroat and subjective it gets on Champion Row even when they have to bring in multiple judges to kind of figure out. It's not so much that it's cutthroat, is that we each, like it or not, we have our own way of interpreting the standard and applying the standard. And again, we're going to get into that next week, y'all, so don't miss that show. But um, it's just the difference between people. It's really what it all boils down to. Yeah, like I'll have Gold sometimes expectations. I'll have a friend mm-hmm. over and she raises the same variety I do. So we'll put some birds up in the cage and we'll both stand back and talk about them and discuss them. And she'll go, well, I really like the comb on that one. That's something that I need to see in my flock. And I'm like, yeah, the comb's nice, but look at the chest. And then you have to decide, well, is the chest more important than the comb? Well, absolutely. <laughs> so like one thing I've been looking at the last several years is chest depth. And that is hard to improve. That's going to take me a while to just inch that chest down to what the standard wants. I I am going to need five or 10 years for that. (laughs) One thing that we've been talking about, selection and finding the better birds in the flock. And 
something we'll get into again next week. But, you know, the longer you tolerate a defect in your flock, the longer you're going to have it and the harder it becomes to get rid of. You perpetuate what you tolerate. Cull, cull, cull. I didn't get to be ruthless until probably about five years ago where I started like, especially when I was seeing pale leg color or at the time I was battling the slip wing too. So I had to just take a very no nonsense approach to that and not be generous on females that were trying to hide a poor wing. Cause if they hid it from me, then I kind of pretended like I didn't see it. <laughs> but then I started seeing it in the offspring and I was like, man, I'm really going to have to get in here and nitpick and really ruthlessly go through them. If I'm going to ever stop seeing this. And I did. Like it cleaned it up pretty quick though. Didn't it? Oh yeah. One season of ruthless selection will straighten out a lot unless it's something recessive that you have to track parentage to find it's real Which, important again, to figure out where that's that coming from because yeah. you might have two birds the male and the female and they visually check out they pass the hand feel they look like really good examples but then when you breed them together you see something unexpected sometimes <laughs> there's recessive traits and there's polygenetic traits that require just all sorts of crazy factors to express well, yeah, let's not confuse the factor there. You have to let the percentage of expression let you know how big of a problem it is. Like if it doesn't exceed like 3% or whatever percentage you want to come up with, less than 5% is yeah. probably not that big of a deal, but it might be later. So tracking parentage again, in case you need to backtrack back to grandparents to get to the bottom of stuff that pops out later. Sure. Well, luckily there's no set processing time on the heritage breeds. And as we've discussed, the only thing that really changes is the cooking method. If you have to reach back to get rid of something, you still can make coco vin or, you know, chicken fricassee. If you have good records and can reach back and find it and root it out. One question I get asked a lot is when you're evaluating birds, what age do you evaluate your birds? I don't know. Continuously. It can vary from breed to breed. It can vary from variety within that breed. It can vary from different strains of the same breed and variety. I, just, I take each hatch as a cohort, start evaluating the hat. I go for the center of the hatch window is my ideal because I want heterogeneity among my, among my flocks. So the first out and last out are almost always disqualified for some reason anyways. So I've learned not to even pay attention to them unless there's a rock star. That shows up, but that's very rare. But the first three weeks can tell you a lot. Daily weights. If you can mark your birds and weigh them daily, the information that is locked in those first three weeks can serve you to map out the rest of the bird's potential life if they're cared for and fed and watered correctly. Well, it goes a long way in helping you learn your genetics too. I found that even looking at it from when to call for what traits, I don't really look at wings until after they've done a couple of molts and we're coming up closer to like four and a half, five, six months old because some of mine will grow so fast the wings get funky because of that. But then they're just fine later after they've finished growth and they look great. Uh, But something I've noticed having larger hatches helps because if you're comparing 12 birds amongst each other, it's a lot harder to see inconsistencies as if you were mm-hmm. comparing 50 birds amongst each other. Having Very a larger true. sample set, and we talked about this earlier, having a larger sample set, you with the leg color, you can see who's really dark and who's really light within the first couple of weeks probably, right? Already start be making these selections in your head. Nope, you're out, you're out, you're out. You're going to the meat pen, you're going to the meat pen, you're going to the meat pen. You can stay. You can get the good nutrition that costs a little more maybe. One thing that I'm going to throw out here about when to do the selection that is fairly consistent is if you're breeding party colored birds, P-A-R-T-I, that's birds of more than one color, patterned birds, or in the case of reds, it's red bodies, black tails. But when you're breeding those party colored birds, the best time to evaluate for color is wait until they have molded in their last adult primary. When all those primary feathers are in, you can rest assured that the color you see is the color you have to work with. What age is that usually? Depends. You know, in in my reds, 
My females, anywhere from six to seven months old. Okay. Males may be, oh, a month or so later. For mine with the white breast, we have to watch out for yellowing. And it can go all the way until a year and a half before they'll do a little color change on me. And I have to wait for a molt and see what color the new feathers come back in. Because sometimes the new feathers are yellow and not white. <laughs> and that lets yep, me know. Yeah, yeah, I got you can feed a bird for a long time and hope it, you know, makes it through that last toll gate, huh? Well, and then even something like combs, if you don't want to even think about comb size when they're six months old, because that thing is going to keep on changing all the way up till almost two years old. Yeah, absolutely. It might dip over at a year old. And if you've already hatched a bunch from them, you're going to see a bit more of that. And sometimes I get concerned about what I'm telling people will lead them to believe flock improvement is a fast process. And I've tried to stress it several times in our episode today that it's going to take some time. You know, breeding poultry is not a destination. Breeding poultry is a journey because no matter how far you get down the road, you round a corner and go up, there's some more road I need to go down. Well, oh, there's a hazard. I'm yeah. going to yeah. turn left, turn right. <laughs> well, oh, these yeah. topics back in science class that you thought had no relevance in your life, like Punnett squares and laws of segregation and inheritance, all of a sudden became really important. Well, I just hit a fork in the road by getting two completely different body structures out of my flock, and I'm going to have to decide which one or if it's possible to blend them together. I favor blending them together to find the balance of both of those, but I might have to choose. So I'm going to hatch and see and come up with a new plan to aim back at consistency because I hatched myself into so many variables now. <laughs> Speaking of choose, and Mandy, I'll be more than happy to ship you my dartboard if you'd like that. <laughs> I was going to let my hands tell me which ones are better for the table. Ultimately, you know, people who raise chicken eat a lot of chicken. The better yeah. breeders I mean, do eat, anyway. You eat your mistakes, and that's one way. Is taking apart a part of chicken really helps you learn what went into making that chicken and what goes into making a good chicken and what doesn't. When you start looking at heart girth, chest capacity, body depth from the inside, you know, it, it's enlightening. Well, not only does it feed you and teach you, but it also goes a long way in helping to protect your reputation, too, because any bird you let go of is going to be a reflection onto you and your program and your practice. Like it that. or not. Yeah. And, and man, processing birds is one of the best ways I know of to really have a good understanding and a good handle on what is body capacity. What's it supposed to look like? What shouldn't it look like? Those narrow birds, the ones that have to get culled, are the worst to process because eviscerating them just cuts you to shreds. Absolutely. That's why I asked for your advice on kitchen shears for cutting spines out for spatchcocking. Yeah, just crack that thing open like this and put it on a grill with a brick wrapped in aluminum foil on it. That's the best way to do those little birds. Just go ahead and cut the spine out. Yeah. You know they were raised in good conditions, and they probably don't have all the bad things that are associated with chickens. But still, let's not get our hands cut up trying to stuff them into a tiny little bird cavity. Yeah, agreed. Folks, this has been a really good show. I think we've covered a lot of territory. But I want to ask my co-host here, what is one thing you hope people can take away from what we had to share with them today? What's a big benefit that they can get? To be patient. And tolerant, but also ruthless on calling. (laughs) It's a weird balancing act. You'll have to figure it out as you go. I would say the most important thing is doing your due diligence to find the breed that suits your environment. And then finding a breeder who's raised that breed in a similar environment and has similar goals as you. And start with that as a base. I like what both of y'all said. I'm just going to add to that. Breeding is is an art it is a science it is guesswork sometimes but if you keep good records if you evaluate your birds if you reflect on your flock progress you will do well that and said, it's doable at any size too i could oh, do it sure with it 12 to 16 birds and mandy can do it with hundreds uh, how many birds do you have i'm now? gonna get more efficient in time i'll get there i'm still on my journey I haven't even gotten there yet. (laughs) 
Oh huge. man, what a mess. But it's fun. I'm learning so much. I love these birds. They do all the chicken things and then teach you more than you ever wanted to know about chicken. That's the one thing I love about poultry breeding is it is a journey. You never do get to the end of your journey. And it forces you to learn, expand your knowledge base, expand your management style. My mentor told me on more than one occasion, if you're going to breed better birds, you better learn new things. Oh, yeah. Be spongy. Be open-minded. Don't be too hard on yourself. Try to have realistic goals and don't try to do everything once in a season because you can't and you won't and you're just going to end up frustrated. Well, why don't we just end it here and we will see you guys next week when we talk about how to read, interpret, and apply the written standard. Thank you for joining us this week. And before you go, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you can receive new episodes right when they're released every Tuesday. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd like to ask you to drop us an email at poultrykeeperspodcast at gmail.com and share your thoughts about the show. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of the Poultry Keepers Podcast. We'll see you next week.